Hi guys, how's it going? Brian from Brian Boas here. Albinos are one of the most popular morph of boa constrictor available in the world of herpeticulture today. Albinos by themselves are quite spectacular to look at, but albino is also a very common base morph for combination with other genes to make some of the more popular combos such as the sun glow, moon glow, and snow. However, there are a number of different types of albinos and it can be very confusing to keep track of the differences between each type. Today I'll go over the different types of albino boas available today. I'll also show you some examples of albinos, both alone and in combination with some other genes to make different combos. If this is your first time tuning in. I am a breeder of boa constrictors. If you like the contents of this video, I would really appreciate if you would subscribe to the Brian Boas YouTube channel for more videos on all aspects of keeping and breeding boas in captivity. Technically, the correct term for the albino boa constrictor is called amelanistic. And what this refers to is that these animals are missing the major dark pigment, which is called melanin. In the absence of melanin, the animals have oranges and reds and yellows in place of the browns and grays that are normally in uh, the wild type normal uh, boa constrictors. There are two major categories of albinos, the T positive albinos and the T negative albinos. Within each of these categories, there are several different types which are not uh, genetically compatible. So first I'm gonna show you some examples of the T negative albinos, and then I'll show you some examples of the T positive albinos. And when we get to the T positives, I'll explain exactly what the T positive designation means. The first animal I wanna show you is a call strain albino boa. And the call strain was the first available in captivity. And it's also probably the most common strain of albino boa constrictors. So the history of this strain is that there were a couple albino male boas that were exported from Columbia back in the 1980s. They were acquired by the breeder Peter Call, and he bred them to a group of females. One of the males succeeded in impregnating the females and heterozygous offspring that carried the Call albino gene were born. He then crossed these heterozygotes to each other and the first albino boas in captivity were produced back in the early 90s. I remember at the time, these animals were selling for around $10,000 a piece, which to me seemed like an astronomical amount of money to pay for a snake. But had you bought one of these, you probably would have done pretty well on your investment as far as uh, getting your money back and then some. So this particular animal, has been somewhat selectively bred. This is a um, guy was produced by Al Brown and he was bred into a Roni pastel background. He also contains 25% uh, BCC, true red tail boa, uh, Guianan BCC. And so the reason behind this is it really enhances his colors. Unfortunately, this guy is in shed right now. So he looks a little bit more milky than he normally does. Um, but this animal is now six years old and he's retained his colors really well. If you look at his tail, you can see he has these nice orangish tail blotches. Um, they actually have kind of a little bit of a purplish overtone to them. His ground color is kind of a yellowish, um, which is actually quite a bit brighter after he sheds. And one of the um, reputations of the call strain is that the animals lose their color over time. And so this was true with a lot of the original animals from this line, but the color in a boa is determined not just by the one gene for, mel for melanin or you know the lack of melanin. Boa constrictors contain tens of thousands of different genes. So the other genes are also important in contrib contributing to the overall appearance of the boa. So if you cross in boas that have a very bright background color or retain their colors, you're going to get a more colorful albino. And that's the thought behind this pastel albino with the boa constrictor constrictor 
um, influence. There are a number of selectively bred bloodlines of the cow albino which have been bred for enhanced color and enhanced retention of color as the animals grow up. So there's a, a line called the lipstick line. There's also a line called the coral line, which is famous for getting this um, pinkish reddish color on its ventral surface. So this particular guy was actually my first morph boa, where I believe I got him back in 2015 when he was about a year old. And at the time, I had only locality bows in my collection. But I thought, you know, it looked like something cool. I wanted to see how it was keeping a morph boa. And I also remember, as I mentioned, seeing them for like 10 grand when I was a teenager. And now the price had come down at that time to about $300. So I thought it would be something cool to just to check out. And I really enjoyed keeping this guy and, you know, the other small number of morph boas in my collection. Um, one thing you can see with this guy, because of his 25% boa constrictor constrictor ancestry, he's really quite squeezy. You know, he likes to really hold on, and you can see the impressive muscles that this guy has, definitely uh, due to the BCC uh, genes that he has in, in, in him. Another popular way to enhance the colors of the call and other albino strains is to cross them with other morph genes and make multi-gene combos. So one example is called the sun glow where the animal is both amelanistic and hypomelanistic. And what we're looking at here is called a jun glow. So this animal has the call albino gene as well as the hypo gene and the jungle gene. So the hypo gene and the jungle gene both interact with the, uh, the albino gene to enhance the colors. It, it makes the uh, yellows a little bit darker, so the saddles are more of a reddish color. Um, the hypo and the jungle gene also have um, caused some differences in the pattern, so the shape of the saddle is a little bit different. With the jungle gene, you have a really clean dorsal surface, and you can see these color of the sides is a different shade, that's due to the jungle. As well as you have um, more aberrancies of the saddles and sometimes you have striping uh, due to the jungle gene. So the interaction of these three genes gives it a very unique appearance. So one thing I forgot to mention is that the Cal albino strain has a pink tongue rather than a normal black tongue. I don't, hopefully you can see this tongue of this animal, and it, it has these uh, beautiful red eyes. So this is a uh, 2017 female junglo. This was bred by Peter Mestri, who has some really nice uh, lipstick line animals. This is of the lipstick albino line. Um, so just a very unique animal to look at. These designer boas you can almost think of as a living work of art. In addition to the call T-negative albino strain, there's one other major T-negative strain of albino boa, and that's called the Sharp albino. And this line of boa was uh, generated by Brian Sharp. They appeared on the market a few years after the call strain became available. And the call or the Sharp strain has a reputation for enhanced colors and brighter colors and better color retention compared to the call strain. So in general, they command a premium as far as the price and they have a really dedicated uh, following among people that swear by them. However, it's not clear if the difference in color is due specifically to the call versus sharp albino gene or if it's due to the differences in the genetic background. So remember, there are thousands and thousands of genes in snakes, and many, many genes contribute to the color of the snake, not just the one gene. Um, many people working with the call strains have selectively bred them for enhanced colors, such as the lipstick line. And so in my opinion, the, I've seen examples of call animals that are just as nice as the sharp animals. The sharp animals are nice too, so if you want to work with the sharp, you know, go for it, but it'd probably be best if you just choose one, at least at first, to work with. 
because you need to bear in mind the call strain and the sharp strain are not compatible genes. So if you took a sharp albino and a call albino and you bred them together, all of the animals would look normal. They wouldn't be albino, but they're carrying both the sharp and the call albino gene. If you were to cross those heterozygotes, you get a uh, next generation that has some call albino animals, some sharp albino animals, some would be both call and sharp, and it would just be extremely confusing. So as far as I know, no one's bred together both of the genes. Um, I know that Brian Sharp, at, at the time the sharp albino strain became available, he crossed it with the call just to show that it was genetically incompatible and it was a completely different gene. Uh, but it would be really confusing if someone was trying to maintain both sharp and call in the same line. Uh, so not recommended to try to cross them in the same animal. Now I want to discuss the other main category of albino boas, and that's the T-positive albinos. So what exactly does the T stand for? The T is tyrosinase, which is an enzyme or protein that's involved in the synthesis of the dark pigment melanin. So the dark pigment melanin is synthesized in the cells of the boa constrictor skin with a biochemical pathway that has multiple steps. Each of them is dependent on a certain protein that's known as an enzyme. And without that enzyme, the reaction won't happen and the uh, protein won't be synthesized. So in a T negative albino, the tyrosinase production or the tyrosinase is lacking. So the melanin production is completely blocked and there's no production of that melanin dark pigment. In a T-positive albino, you have a partial disruption of the production of melanin because these animals still retain the enzyme tyrosinase. And it gives them this very unique appearance. You can see this guy's got this beautiful yellowish color. Um, he's got a lot of pink overtones to him. If you look at his tongue, the tongue of these animals is kind of a purplish color. So it's definitely lighter than the black tongue seen in a wild type boa, but darker than the pink tongue seen in a T negative albino boa. And overall, just a very beautiful appearance. And they retain this yellow color into their adulthood. They don't have the color fading that is seen often in the T negative albinos. So one of the things I like about the T-positive albinos is that they have a kind of a natural look to them. They don't scream that they're some kind of genetic mutation. If you saw a boa like this in the wild, it wouldn't look that uh, unusual. You would, might think it was even a wild boa, just a very brightly colored um, animal. Another name for the T-positive albino is the caramel albino because they have these beautiful caramel colors. Similar to the T negative albino, there are multiple strains of T positive albinos in boas, and they're not genetically compatible. This strain is called the VPI T positive, and it's probably the most popular strain of T positive boa, and maybe the most beautiful in my opinion. But the VPI stands for Vita Precociosa International, and this is a boa and python breeding operation that's run by Dave and Tracy Barker, who are some of the most renowned uh, herpeticulturalists working with pythons and boas. And they saw a litter of boas in a pet shop back in the late 90s, and two of the babies had this beautiful light yellowish coloration. So they were able to buy this entire group of boas, they bred them together, and they established the VPIT positive and showed it was a simple recessive trait. And these guys became available commercially back in the early 2000s. They were really expensive for a while, but the prices have come down quite a bit in the last few years and they become you know, more affordable for the average boa keeper. In addition to the VPI T positive, there's a number of other strains of T positive boa, such as the Prodigy T positive, the Boa Woman Caramel, the Russian T positive. And there's also a couple strains of locality specific T positive boas, 
including the Nicaraguan T positive, the Costa Rican T positive, and the Argentine T positive. And all these animals have in common this lighter color with a reduction of melanin pigment, but not a complete absence of melanin pigment. So the VPIT positive or the other T positives by themselves are just you know beautiful animals to look at. And they're also the basis for a number of combo morphs. I want to show you an example of a combo morph with the VPIT positive albino. This is called a VPIT positive junglo. And it's similar to the VPI or to the uh, Cal junglo that I showed you earlier, except it has the VPI albino rather than the Cal albino. So it's got the VPI albino, T positive albino in homozygous form. And it also has two incomplete dominant genes, the jungle gene and the hypo gene. So because hypo and jungle are incomplete dominant, the animal only needs one copy of each gene to show the uh, physical uh, manifestation, the phenotype of these genes. And I'll probably make some videos a little later explaining about BOA genetics and what uh, incomplete dominant means. But the combination of the jungle and the hypo with the VPIT positive just really enhances the color. You can see the saddles of this animal are a deeper color, kind of a darker reddish orange color. The jungle gene shows um, this really clean dorsal surface. And then in looking at the sides of this animal, you can see the pinkish sides and this abrupt transition in color between the sides of the animal and the top. The animal shows a lot of striping and aberrancies in the pattern to primarily to the jungle gene, but also a little bit to the hypo gene that has an impact on the shape of the saddles as well. And then this animal has these really distinctive head markings. You can see the patch of color behind the eye um, and the broken head spear due to the jungle gene. So this type of animal, it's not for everyone. I know a lot of people are locality purists and they wanna to stick to their pure localities and that's fine. Um, I didn't get into the Morris until relatively recently. So I won't have any animals that are ready to breed probably for at least another three, maybe four years. But I look forward to watching them grow and you know seeing how they develop over time. That's albino boas in a nutshell. I hope this video was somewhat informative and maybe answered some of your questions about albino boas. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, you can also comment below. Uh, if you liked the video, please subscribe to the Brian Boas YouTube channel for more videos on all aspects of keeping and breeding boas in captivity. I've got a lot of really cool ideas for videos that I hope to be releasing in the pretty uh, not too distant future, so please stay tuned. Thank you for your attention and enjoy your boas.